This is episode 103 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage had left nothing unmarked. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Austin, Texas, where we got a little bit of our freedom back. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? They've lifted some of the restrictions. And I uh, hope wherever you're at, they lift all of them. Uh, we shall see in the coming weeks how it works. But uh, what a mess. And we've hit a lot of aspects of this coronavirus craziness over the last several weeks. And uh, I, I need to hit the a giant, a giant aspect of this whole thing. A hugely important aspect, the economy, the economics of this mess, this downturn that we're apparently in at the moment. Was it even caused by the virus? Uh, my guest today says no. We were headed for this and the virus may have uh, kind of poked the bubble, it popped the bubble, so to speak. And uh, why do we have bubbles? And why were we headed for this downturn no matter what? And uh, what are the economics of this lockdown? It's only made it worse, a lot, lot worse. And uh, I know you guys probably have some, some of the crazy people in your lives yelling on social media that we need to stay locked down for another month or two. Uh, well, we talk about the massive long-term destruction that stuff's causing, uh, the mistake from day one of doing all of that stuff. And of course, if you're talking economics, you have to talk the Federal Reserve. And uh, that's, uh, that's something we get into. And when you talk economics, you got to get someone from the Mises Institute. And that's what I've done. I went out and got Mark Thornton to come back to the show. You guys probably remember he was on, gosh, it's been over a year, I bet. Uh, back then we talked about his book, The Skyscraper Curse. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, this economy and this downturn that we're sitting in right now and how he saw it coming and why he saw it coming the uh, fundamentals of the economy, how weak they were, despite what you were told uh, from your local media, from your national media. And uh, let's get right into this. Mark Thornton, you guys remember him, he's a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. Uh, gosh, he's done a lot. He was the editor of Austrian Economics Newsletter, a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Libertarian Studies and several other uh, academic journals. He served as a member of of the graduate faculties of Auburn University and Columbus State Universities, taught economics at Auburn University at Montgomery and Trinity University right here in Texas. He's a graduate of St. Bonaventure University and received his PhD in economics from Auburn University. He's here. He's back. He's with us on Death to Tyrants. Dr. Mark Thornton, welcome back to the show. How are you? I am very glad to be here with you today in this uh, very important time in everybody's life. Yeah, no kidding. It's such a bizarre time in everyone's life. How are things down in Auburn? Uh, have you been working from home? Do you go to the Institute? Um, I have been working from home. I have gotten out a few times. There's a drive through uh, restaurants, uh, curbside restaurants. Uh, I dropped my uh, laptop off yesterday at the Institute out front and uh, retrieved it that same way. I have been in the Institute once, but it was Sunday night when no one was there. And um, there's not a lot of traffic around town. Of course, the students are not here. There's a lot of police presence uh, everywhere. In the few times that I have gone out, I've always seen multiple uh, police cars. So they, they are definitely enforcing this lockdown. But, you know, traffic otherwise seems pretty normal. It seems like during times like this, and not specifically virus moments like pandemics, but uh, economic downturns, I think a lot of people more than usual probably turn to institutions like Mises and, and economists like yourself. Are you guys seeing more uh, inquiries and, and traffic online there with the Mises Institute site? I haven't heard anything lately, but almost from the very beginning, our numbers on the webpage uh, spiked up really high. I'm pretty sure that's still the case. And we are covering this situation um, 
on a daily basis, basically from every different angle. Uh, I just looked at the uh, the web page and virtually all of the articles uh, in the last two weeks or so have been about the situation, about the crisis, and basically about the problems of, of government intervention uh, of so many different types, um, all of which, of course, are negative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to talk about the thesis of your recent piece there on Mises.org. You saw this thing coming, and obviously not the virus aspect of this, but rather the economic downturn. Can you talk about that and the relation you see or don't see between the virus and this downturn that we're kind of experiencing at this moment? Sure. I'd be very happy to. Um, I've been expecting an economic crisis uh, for quite some time, and various factors in recent months uh, have told me that basically the, an economic crisis was right around the corner. We get into some of the details of that, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, but, you know, when you looked at the economy in the month before uh, the outbreak of the virus in mid-March, I think is when everything started shutting down. But in February, you know, stock markets were at all time highs. Uh, the unemployment rate reached record lows. Uh, the number of job openings was at an all-time record. And everybody was uh, so happy. They were giggling in my gym about how much extra money they had, um, you know, comparing stock tips and uh, planning worldwide vacations and, and all sorts of uh, unusual behavior on the part of people I've known for decades, basically. And those those kind of almost psychological factors really made me tune in to what was going on in the real economy. What I saw in the fundamentals of the real economy was all totally bad. So in, in the aggregate, in terms of the overall stock market, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, everything looked marvelous. Uh, the unemployment rate uh, looked unbelievably low, uh, heading lower more people entering the job market than ever. But fundamentally, things were very bad. And so I view the outbreak of this virus and the government shutdown as the trigger of the economic crisis, something that brought it forward in time a little bit. The uh, shutdown and uh, is probably going to make uh, the economic crisis longer, much longer. And ultimately, it's going to lead what economists call a lower trough in the business cycle. So if you were to draw a squiggly line representing GDP on a whiteboard, uh, you would see that the as, as the squiggle moving from left to right goes down, and then before it comes back up, that's the trough. And so no doubt uh, the shutdown is going to make that trough much lower for a longer period of time we're going to suffer from this, economically speaking, uh, for a long time to come. And it's not from the virus. The virus is really probably a little worse than a, a bad flu season. But this whole thing has been dealt with uh, incredibly uh, badly by the government, and not just our government, of course, but governments around the world. You mentioned there that the fundamentals of the economy were weak. And I think uh, when the average person, you know, back in February, like you mentioned, sees their 401k is going up and the stock market uh, is at all time highs. You know, of course, you've got Trump bragging that it's his deal. I've heard people on the left say, no, he inherited a wonderful economy from Barack Obama and it was actually him. I want you to differentiate between those kind of things that people see and actually why you realized the fundamentals were weak, that everything people saw doesn't mean everything is great. That's right. And, um, you know, uh, mainstream economists, politicians, and even the general public, and certainly the media, they're focused on these aggregate statistics, economic statistics that they can get their hands around. So things like GDP, gross domestic product, the overall production and consumption in an economy, that's fairly easy to understand. It's fairly easy to, to describe you know, GDP went up 3.4%. Let's celebrate. Um, and the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 
that is, you know, when they first came up with that, they wanted an easy way to express, you know, what's going on in the overall stock market, but not in terms of, you know, the fundamentals or what industries are doing well, what industries are doing poorly. Um, and so it's a simple, these, those two things are simple minded, uh, as well as the unemployment rate, it, you know, if it moves up, that's great. If it moves down, um, that's bad. I mean, excuse me, the other way around when it goes up, of course, that's worse. And when it goes down, it's supposed to be better. And, uh, but that's really inappropriate for looking at the real true fundamentals of an economy and uh, so I broke down all of the various primary sectors uh, in the economy to show why the fundamentals were bad and why we were headed for an economic crisis. And I start with a consumer uh, because everyone out there is a consumer. So it's the biggest subcategory in the economy. And so when you look at the American consumer on the eve of this crisis, what you found was a very bad picture, not a good picture but a very bad picture uh, of Americans. And, and basically, when you look at their individual balance sheet, what you find is that savings were atrociously low, uh, extremely bad. People, Americans, just simply, by and large, did not have uh, much savings, had not increased uh, the level of savings in the overall economy. Uh, if you look at... Um, the majority of Americans, consumers, what you find is that 60% of all American households had less than $1,000 in savings, not enough to overcome some unforeseen event, usually medical, appliances, that kind of thing. Uh, and a third of Americans had absolutely no savings at all. In other words, they were uh, adding to debt without having any savings. Uh, so that's a third of the American households. And so now, of course, some people have plenty of savings. Uh, the top 1% have plenty of savings, uh, but the vast majority have almost none. And uh, and so that's a problem because, you know, problems are going to come along for American individuals as individuals. And it's also going to affect uh, Americans as a whole. And this crisis is uh, hitting uh, the vast majority uh, of Americans and um, and so that's a problem. Too little savings. And when we turn to the other side of the balance sheet, we see enormous amounts of debt. OK, consumer debt uh, basically has doubled since the last economic crisis in 08. You know, the student loan bubble uh, has doubled from 800 billion to one point six trillion. Uh, when we look at corporations, we see the majority of them have added debt. Uh, to a significant amount. And then, of course, uh, the government sector, where um, the federal government, even during an economic expansion, uh, was regularly adding uh, a trillion or more dollars to the national debt. So the whole you know, balance sheet of America uh, was in entirely the wrong direction. And so uh, when you hit a crisis like this, completely unexpected by leaders and government and business communities, uh, it's a huge problem. In certain corners uh, lately, I've heard that really this downturn will be a quick one. And I, I've seen it likened to a drop in GDP over the weekend kind of thing when everyone's not working. Uh, in other words, the shutdown is just causing this pent up demand that is just ready to spring back up basically and, and return to normal as soon as these lockdowns are lifted. Why is that summation incorrect? Well, for some individuals, that will be true. Um, you know, if, if you've uh, been out of work and you're down to your last penny and all of a sudden your job opens up, well, things are going to look much better. Uh, but, you know, for the overall economy, uh, that's just not going to be the case. And I, I've heard that, uh, you know, someone wrote me the other day, well, what about the $6.5 trillion stimulus package? Uh, that was just announced, along with another $350 uh, billion for small business. The problem here is that this is all either just adding to debt or it's money given to the little guy uh, that's going to be used for consumption. 
And what we're looking for is production. And so, you know, yes, there's going to be a lot of people opening up. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people going to work. Uh, and that's going to solve some of the problem of the shutdown, of course. Uh, there's no doubt going to be some bounce back uh, as a result of that. We've seen the stock market bounce back um, considerably. I think it's about halfway back from its crash levels to its highs. Uh, but ultimately, we still have a fundamentally screwed up economy. And we can see that, for example, in labor markets. Okay, in labor markets, um, the situation is a lot of disconnections. You know, we have an unemployment rate before this crisis hit of college graduates, of recent college graduates, of uh, over 40%. Okay, that's, uh, that's extremely high. One third of every college graduate who is uh, still working is underemployed before the crisis even started. Uh, you know, so you have people who are working in jobs where a college degree was not necessary in order to get that job. Okay, so they expected going to college that they'd be middle class, and what they are is lower middle class at, at best. And this was before the crisis hit. And the Fed has also induced a distortion in our labor markets to the extent that its low interest rate policy has caused entrepreneurs bark on much longer term projects, cutting edge projects as a result of those low interest rates. In other words, companies can borrow at low interest over long periods of time. So they're permitted to uh, basically embark on these long term projects. And as a result, uh, you see things like uh, people trying to create new internet-based businesses, uh, new advanced computer chips, iPhones, et cetera, uh, new pharmaceuticals, these long-term projects that take years to get set up, uh, many of which are going to fail. Okay, So the, the distortions caused by this decade-long zero interest rate policy are coming home to roost. Uh, and so what's been happening prior to the crisis is that there have been uh, a lot of jobs available for electrical engineers, uh, for example, uh, bioscientists in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, patent level attorneys, uh, and it, the best job markets is people educated in those areas having graduate degrees who can really create the next generation of technology, which sounds great, but we all learned in the tech bubble that you know, all of these internet-based companies were um, doomed to begin with uh, or were fraudulent. And uh, and we saw so many failures as a result. Well, that's what we're going to see here, too, as well, is we're going to see a lot of those companies failing or at least uh, not doing very well at all. I mean, major pharmaceutical companies might not go out of business, but you're going to see uh, bankruptcies and slowdowns and shutdowns. Uh, layoffs, uh, et cetera, as a result of this distortion. But those people in those labor markets are getting tremendous pay. You know, patent attorneys for uh, iPhone manufacturers uh, making a huge amount of money. But that draws money away from uh, the demands of consumers uh, without the distortion and it distorts wage rages, wage rates in, in, in other professions. And so we've got a lot of distortions to work through uh, in the basic uh, areas uh, like labor markets. I love talking to guys like you because Austrians get the issue with the Federal Reserve seemingly better than any other group of, that are interested in economics. Um, and I want to touch upon the interest rate thing because that's key, in my opinion. Uh, can you talk about how should interest rates truly be determined in an in a actual free market? Because people say that, you know, we're in a free market now. And, and I always argue that the Federal Reserve being there makes it not a free market by its very nature. Uh, so how should interest rates actually in a free market be determined as opposed to how they are by the Fed right now? Yeah, well, the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, which determines the basic interest rate upon which all other interest rates like mortgages and car loans are based. 
Okay, so this is the worst type of government intervention in the economy. Everything else pales in comparison to the interest rate manipulation by the Federal Reserve because that affects everything else. It affects the stock market. It affects entrepreneurial decision-making of what projects to go forward with. Um, It certainly uh, affects the stock market. Uh, Every time the interest rate is lowered, the discounting that measures and produces uh, values, economic price values for assets gets distorted. So the lower the interest rate, the higher the price of stocks, bonds, land, and real estate. And so they're fundamentally playing games with all of the assets in what is supposed to be capitalism. So it's fundamentally distorting you know, all of that. And the stock market is what keeps capitalism on track. And so if the stock market is being manipulated by presidents and their central banks, uh, then you're just asking for trouble. In this case, you're asking for a disaster uh, to eventually happen. They all like it when the boom is underway. But when the bus comes in, you know, the uh, everybody runs for cover, uh, basically. And, you know, when you look at it, investment advisors and academic economists and Wall Street economists and real estate economists, they all have their model, which says the trend is going to continue. There's no worry, buy and hold, all that kind of nonsense. Crises emerge like this one. All of a sudden, they all start sounding kind of quasi-Austrian in their interpretation of what's going on. Not fully. I mean, they don't fully understand it. But when you describe reality, that's what you're really talking about is Austrian economics. It's a reality-based uh, form of economics. Uh, it's uh, microeconomic-based, uh, what we they call macroeconomics. Uh, but notice, I don't really talk about things like GDP as the main uh, measure of an economy. I'm talking about individual markets, individual groups uh, that you you have to study in order to understand the fundamentals, uh, and the fundamentals will ultimately uh, come to the forefront as they have today. You mentioned that uh, the student loan sector has been badly distorted. I've heard others uh, that I that I respect say the same thing. Why is that? How did that come about? That the student loan debt is so crazy, and and that that market seems to be uh, a bubble in itself right now. Well, I don't really think student loans on the scale we're seeing today are a good thing at all. You know, there is a premium that people get for going to college and getting a degree. Uh, But first of all, it has to be the right kind of degree. Unless you're coming from a ultra wealthy uh, family, you know, you want to make college count uh, because you're giving up years of your life uh, and so you have to be rewarded for that in the form of higher incomes. And there is this premium that people get uh, if they choose the right major, if they succeed in graduating, um, you know, and if they apply themselves to something that is in demand uh, in the economy. And so you see higher wages for, you know, things like engineering, medicine, law school, uh, even business school. Uh, at least in the past. So the problem is, is that government subsidies to higher education, and there's many, many, many different subsidies. School loans uh, are not the only subsidy, far from it. State universities are subsidized, and they also get federal uh, subsidies. Uh, There's research grants, most of which are directed by the government. Um, And then there's a a need-based money uh, in many states. And uh, they, of course, they're tax exempt. uh, And so on every angle, uh, college education is subsidized. And of course, you see uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and some of the nutcases on the left um, wanting to give away free college education and forgive all student loans and and all this nonsense. Well, that's just even more of a subsidy. Uh, And the problem with subsidies is you get too much of something, 
uh, and you cause its price to rise. And so these subsidies have, in effect, you know, caused an increase in demand. But that increase in demand, of course, drives up. Uh, the price of a college education. And so people wonder why college education is so expensive. Well, it's because of the subsidies. So when people are concerned about the high price of college, uh, they don't they, they don't have the, the right idea. And so they call for even more subsidies. And so politicians reward that political call with even more subsidies. And it's caused higher education to be uh, unaffordable. And hence, The amount of students who are applying for student loans and for greater amounts of student loans uh, has grown incredibly rapidly. Uh, And, you know, student loans get paid off. So it's not like every student loan is still on the books. So the fact that we've gone from 800 billion on the books uh, to 1.6 trillion on the books, well, over those 10 years, a lot of student loans got paid off. And so the problem is more acute than most people realize. And it's a never ending win. It's an, it's an unwinnable war. Uh, because as I said before, subsidies just merely increase the demand for college education. And that increase in demand, of course, uh, drives up cost and drives up price. And, uh, and so that's not the way to do it. And, you know, we've got way too many college graduates. Um, And as I mentioned earlier in the interview, 30% of all college graduates are underemployed to the extent that the the job that they're in does not require a college education. And so, uh, and as I mentioned also at that same point, uh, I think it's 44% of recent college graduates are either out of work or underemployed. So they're not working as uh, accountants or engineers uh, or things of that nature, uh, or they may be working part-time in those fields, or they may be working, you know, not at all. They may be, you know, waiting on tables and living in their parents' basement, basically. Right. And that figure, of course, is going to do nothing but uh, skyrocket once the uh, smoke is cleared on this uh, incredible bout of uh, unemployment that we've seen in the last five weeks. Can you talk about this phenomenon of giant corporations buying back basically their own stock shares uh, rather than investing in production? Uh, What incentives are driving that? Well, it's a very good question and nobody seems to uh, pay much attention to that. But basically what we've seen um, over the last two decades, really, uh, is that corporations who are earning profits, uh, they're not distributing much in terms of dividends, uh, but what they're doing is they're buying back their own stock from their stockholders. Uh, so they buy it back and it goes off the books. And so whatever income or profits are generated are divided by a smaller number of shares. And so the basically that is a enormous factor in stock price. Uh, The reasons the corporations want to do that, in part, is that uh, the pay and the wealth generated for the corporate leaders and the top employees is, uh, is based on their stock options. So if they can run up the price of their stock of the company, they're going to run up the value of their stock options. And, uh, and so it benefits them directly. So the people essentially who are controlling things are using company profits, not for their shareholders uh, necessarily, but, you know, in the form of dividends and income, uh, but they're benefiting themselves. And so that's a big part of it. The other part is when corporations look around and, you know, they have all these retained earnings. Um, And what they find is that they uh, don't have a lot of profit opportunities in terms of investing in uh, new products uh, and in new operations, new franchises, uh, new product lines, uh, new production facilities, uh, new production uh, technologies. Uh, They don't see any profit there in investing in the company. 
Uh, and so what are they going to do? Uh, well, if they give the money to shareholders, that's going to be taxed. It's going to be double taxed um, by the corporate and the individual uh, tax rate. And so they're in a kind of a quandary. So they're kind of being pushed by their self-interest into these uh, buybacks, but also because they don't see any uh, opportunities for investing in productive activities, capital and technology, um, that brings to mind the fact that because the Fed has kept interest rates at 0% uh, for 10 years, that suggests to me uh, that the marginal utility uh, or the marginal value of investing in technology and productivity has fallen close to zero. Okay, so um, the American economy has generated so many, for example, nail salons. Let's take a simple example uh, that there's no opportunity to expand those franchises any further, or uh, in terms of cell phones, that the American economy, in conjunction with, of course, Many economies and uh, tech industries around the world don't really see any opportunity for investing uh, in production uh, or in uh, technology uh, in those areas uh, because the marginal benefit is now close to zero. You know, the marginal returns uh, are close to zero for so many corporations. Our leading corporations are all basically in the same boat as They've already done as much investing as is, is warranted, um, whether it's technology or nail salons or uh, McDonald's restaurants, uh, you know, you name it, uh, we've done it uh, and we pushed the limit. And so uh, the entrepreneur is, is basically stuck uh, with the fact that they're where to put their money. And so a lot of it goes into stock buybacks rather than in uh, productivity, and we've seen companies uh, like Radio Shack, for example, it went down that path, and, and the path leads to bankruptcy, basically. Um, Sears did that, and the same thing with stock buybacks. Th these were a couple of the leaders who started doing it first, and, and it led Sears into bankruptcy. And so this is a very bad situation um, in an economy. That's not the way things are supposed to be uh, with normal interest rates uh, and normal risk tolerances built into those interest rates. Um, basically, these corporations will be much more careful with their money and you would never get to the point where, where there were no new technologies or facilities or uh, anything like that where there would be no opportunities for profit. That just seems ridiculous. But of course, we're seeing nothing but ridiculous things happening uh, to this economy. And there's distortions brought about by the Federal Reserve, like negative oil prices, negative interest rates, negative interest rates on government bonds. Um, these are things that are so very perplexing. Um, these are things that never, ever should have happened. But because of the Federal Reserve the European Central Bank, uh, the Bank of Japan, and all these other major central banks have led us into this um, uh, dystopian uh, situation where up is down, left is right, A is B, B is C. Um, you know, it's it's just crazy nonsense out there. But ultimately, the real villain here is the power that the Federal Reserve has. Yeah, an unintended consequence of a lot of this to me is is you get people saying, well, if this is capitalism and this is the free market, then I'm I'm against it. And the average Bernie voter uh, sees these bailouts for the giant corporations. And although Bernie keeps talking about the big banks, he doesn't seem to talk about the big bank, the Federal Reserve, but all of these giant corporate welfare handouts. And, and so people like that see that and they're like, well, capitalism's killing this whole country. So the best thing to do is obviously institute democratic socialism to cure the problem. What would you say to someone of that mindset? Well, I would say if, if this is capitalism, then I'm against it too. <laughs> um, I'm for the free market. You've got to be for an unaltered uh, free market economy without any Federal Reserve, uh, with a sound money system like the gold standard, uh, like unalterable 
property rights. Like the government can't tell me to shelter in, right? Um, and a restaurant can tell you, you can't come in my restaurant because A, uh, there's too many people in there already, or B, you're not wearing a mask, or C, you look like you're an at-risk uh, person, uh, too old and frail uh, to come into my restaurant, so I'm keeping you out. Uh, that's what unalterable property rights can do, and that's how unalterable property rights can save us from this virus, um, as it is currently doing. I mean, people, not many people, but people are uh, going it alone in terms of how do I operate my business in a safe way? And th this is happening all over the world, um, is that people are coming up with ways to address uh, the virus uh, and to keep their customers safe uh, and to keep their employees safe. And if our government and other governments had been honest and open with us about this uh, virus from the beginning, you know, various industry industry groups, labor unions um, started putting their uh, brains together and, and uh, asking consultants to come in and, and fix the business so that my employees and my customers are going to be safe. Um, and there's many, many different ways of, of doing that. As we've seen already, uh, companies that remain open are addressing uh, this situation. Um, and so that's what a free market is. And that's how a free market can solve this problem and any other problem, basically, uh, is being left alone and allow entrepreneurs, industry groups, labor unions, et cetera, uh, to deal with these situations. Uh, they should have, t you know, said, you know, just like the virus, uh, senior citizens and retirees uh, should sh shelter in place. Um, the pre-K children should probably uh, shelter in place, as they would be doing anyways, uh, along with seniors and, and retirees. Uh, that's what they'd be doing in any case. Uh, and let everybody else go out there and deal with this virus uh, on their own accord, because, of course, you know, the vast majority of people from young people uh, on up to, you know, middle-aged people, certainly they can catch the virus, but the, the overall hospitalization rate and death rate uh, there is clearly uh, very, very small, uh, and it would be very, very similar to influenza in a regular year. And so with all the testing we've seen, uh, with all the entrepreneurial solutions that we've seen, uh, if we just talked about the success stories uh, rather than just counting death people um, on mainstream media and telling people, you know, you know how to deal with the situation rather than just shelter in place. Well, you know, there's a lot of ways that people can boost their immune system um, that I know of. I've, I've read a lot of scientific reports. I've uh, read a lot of reports by people, doctors and so forth, um, medical journalists who uh, all basically point to the same thing or things. And that is, you know, you want to sleep well, you want to have a good diet, you want to take supplements, uh, especially uh, vitamin D uh, and, and, and important minerals like zinc. Um, you know, eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, and, and chances are uh, people who are healthy in that respect, uh, with, re with respect to the fact that they're sleeping well, that they're doing some exercising, that they have a good diet, and that they're supplementing it with targeted supplements, you know, there's very little uh, lethality that it would exist in that age group, which is the productive group in our society. Uh, the people that are going to school, uh, the people who are doing the work, the people who are making the investments, the people who are managing operations, uh, there would be, you know, very little um, problem uh, of an unusual nature. Uh, and that's what our government should have been doing. That's what governments like Sweden, that's what governments like uh, Hong Kong, 
uh, Singapore, uh, Taiwan. These places have had open economies uh, for virtually the entire time, past like the first couple of weeks. Uh, they recommend uh, that people in, in public should be wearing masks. Uh, they recommend businesses to that you're allowed to prevent people from coming into your um, into your establishment if they're not wearing masks. And of course, as you know, Buck, uh, wearing masks uh, is not designed to uh, help the mask wearer. It's designed to help other people. And so, you know, it's a selfless thing that those people are doing. Uh, some com- countries are requiring the same thing, but uh, you know, like Taiwan, it's it's not required; it's voluntary, um, and it's also voluntary if somebody doesn't want you in their business for either not wearing a mask or coughing, uh, or just the fact that there's too many people inside already. So again, you know, a free market private property regime uh, is um, is basically uh, the way to go. And the country, the countries that I mentioned. Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and Sweden are all very open societies. Some of them are democratic, some of them are autocratic, um, but they're getting the job done. And their, you know, their numbers of deaths, and mostly those four examples, are have very crowded urban areas. Things are really uh, very much under control, and their economies are completely open. Where do you see the, uh, I guess, foreseeable future, maybe the long-term damage of this economic downturn going? Because I've heard from the people that shut down cheerleaders that we need to keep this shut down for at least, well, I've heard that here in Austin from people, another month or two to see where this goes to make sure not too many people die. But I think there's often a misunderstanding of what exactly a true economic downturn, the damage that that can cause. So how do you uh, see that relationship and and what will this downturn end up looking like, do you think? Well, the lockdown uh, was a bad mistake. Uh, We should have never shut down the economy uh, in the way that they did because, you know, it's hard, it's going to be hard to put back together uh, the economy that existed in the past. Politicians, uh, and I'm writing an article about this right now, politicians view the economy as a light switch, that they can turn it off and they can turn it on. Other people view the economy as Humpty Dumpty, and that this crisis saw Humpty Dumpty falling off the fence and cracking into a huge number of pieces that could be, will not be put back together again. Actually, a free market economy, uh, entrepreneurs will eventually put things back together again. Uh, But we've already consumed a lot of wealth. The government has added a tremendous amount of debt uh, with no production increases to pay for it. And and so overall, basically what we're consuming is our wealth and our capital, uh, and that's going to be bad for the economy for a very long time. Uh, So we need to get out of this lockdown as soon as possible, and we need to get out of it and the government needs to keep its hands off completely. Uh, and, and they're not doing that right now. All the things that the, the uh, federal government, for example, uh, have been doing is completely wrong in terms of consuming our savings and wealth and capital, uh, which is what our standard of living is based on and what our wage rates are based on. Uh, so getting out of that as quickly as possible uh, we're going to have a lower standard of living. Uh, it will, if we get to back to free market principles, uh, those standards of living will continue to rise. But the loss that we've suffered is going to be with us uh, for a very long time, really uh, forever. Uh, it's an opportunity that we've lost. Um, and we, But we, we can get back on the path to growth and higher standards of living. Uh, it's just that we, we need to do so as quickly and as smart as possible. And I think that that's what the government can do. So basically, uh, we need to stop the bleeding uh, in the economy. Uh, we need to get back to work. Uh, we need to get the government back on first principles, which is a small, limited government um, with a balanced budget, uh, low taxes, 
Uh, deregulation would help enormously. Uh, the regulations that existed prior to all this, as well as the new ones that have been put in place, are going to make it much more difficult uh, for entrepreneurs to get us back on track. So there's no reason why we need the minimum wage at this time. Uh, get rid of the minimum wage and, and the taxes that are imposed on uh, employees below the minimum wage. Uh, right now, the unemployment benefits that have been given out, um, basically, uh, rational people are deciding, well, it's better for me to collect unemployment. So that's also a program which seems well-intentioned, but can really muck up an economy on a regular basis. But certainly, it does so um, during an economic crisis where people say, well, I think I'll continue to collect unemployment even though I've got a job. Uh, but if I take the job, I might have a, you know, 0.01% chance of dying. So why risk it mm -hmm. uh, when I'm getting basically the same amount of money? So get the government out of it and get America back to work and let's start healing the economy. Well put, uh, Dr. Thornton. Where can my listeners find uh, your work online, including not only your articles, but your books as well? Well, of course, Mises.org. M-I-S-E-S -E dot O-R-G. I'm sure many of our listeners have heard of that and have used it before. The articles that have been written in the last several weeks about this crisis are invaluable. I mean, they are so valuable. They are so on target. Uh, so not just me, but a lot of great writers from a lot of different angles um, is an incredible source of economic sanity. You know, things that you would never hear of in the mainstream media. As a matter of fact, you hear the wrong things in the mainstream media all the time. Um, so get your head out of that mainstream TV media and get it into a place where you're going to get solid information uh, and where you can learn things. You can actually, within a very few days, learn something about something like unemployment insurance and become, you know, close to being an expert on the, on the topic. Um, and so my, all my articles are there. Uh, we have all sorts of things. And most of my books are, have been published by the Mises Institute. So if you Googled Mises.org, my name, Mark Thornton, T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N, and the title of a book like the Skyscraper Curse book uh, or Quotable Mises, Essay on Economic Theory, and PDF – and what you'll find in Google is you're going to have a link which takes you directly to the book site where you can either buy it very inexpensively or download a PDF copy of the book for free. And uh, with uh, the Skyscraper Kate, the Skyscraper Curse book, uh, there's an audio version as well. And I think there's actually maybe a Spanish translation of uh, the essay on economic theory. So go there, uh, get some good, solid information in economics. Um, and I think you're going to be not only smarter, but you're going to feel a lot better about living through this economic crisis. Well put. And uh, I, I second that, everything he just said. I've said it many times, the Mises Institute is the greatest organization on the planet, and I truly mean that. And I'm honored to have Mark Thornton from the Mises Institute back on the show again. Thank you so much, Dr. Thornton, for being here. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. All right, I hope you guys learned some stuff. And uh, like he said there at the end, go visit Mises.org. Just Google his name. You can Google Mises Institute, Mark Thornton, and you'll find all kinds of stuff. And like he mentioned, you can read his stuff, his books in PDF format for free. These guys truly, truly do live their principles. and They're offering you this vast amount of knowledge for free. And uh, that's how good those guys are. So, if you want to join the Libertarian Party, I've got a link for you, lp.org slash death to tyrants. And I thank you guys that have done that. Uh, I get a little notice each time you do, so I appreciate that. Uh, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash death to tyrants podcast. I've got a Patreon if you're willing to donate. Patreon.com, guess what? Slash death to tyrants. You can follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B U C K R E B E L. And until next time, y'all have a very good week. You get split in fucking half, cause I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast.
Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the Iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.